I mean, Dick uh, Griffin. So I'm going to try to do it, though. You know, I was trying to remember how I know Dick, and I this is not a roast, but I know Dick from Yale. He went to Yale, and I visited Yale and did the tours. So that's how that's how I know Dick. Uh, I have, we have, Dick and I have known each other since uh, 1973, and <clears throat> there's really nobody that I know. First, for those of you who know my wife, Joyce, Dick is definitely her favorite of my friends. There's no, there's no question about that. And, and there's nobody who I know that has spent his life doing the kinds of things that he's done as well as he's done and had such a, an impact on the things you all are dealing with here at this uh, conference. Hey, Dick went to Yale, went to Yale I, I think, you know, again, I don't have it all written down because I didn't know I was doing this, but he, he worked at the board years ago. He was uh, general counsel for the operating engineers for about 150 years. Uh, you know, and then, of course, he did the most recent time as a, uh, as a board member. Uh, that we were saying we might have to, you know, wipe that time out of the out of the records, and now he's general counsel of the board. It is an extraordinary career. He has an extraordinary uh, family, and uh, you know, I'm just honored to uh, have him here and introduce him. So thank you, Dick. It's a great honor and a privilege to be here, particularly to be introduced by my old friend, Vince Trevelli. And uh, I had decided, my, my assignment, I think, is to talk about uh, National Labor Relations Act issues of importance during the Obama administration and beyond. So I can't turn this into a Vince Trevelli life history uh, roast. But uh, Vince and his wife, Joyce, who was for a, a long time the dean of this law school and who relatively recently has been promoted to a higher position and I understand would be here except she's homesick today, uh, have done great work and I really appreciate uh, the uh, introduction and uh, uh, the invitation to be here. Uh, I'm just going to talk for two minutes uh, because there are a number of people in the room. Some people here do know me, but a lot of people don't just to expand a little bit on Vince's extensive description of my background. Uh, and, uh, and then I'm going to talk about, I think, four issues that are currently pending at the board. Uh, just to, I, I did, graduate from, did graduate from law school in 1981. Uh, I was uh, employed initially at the NLRB as counsel to board member John Fanning. I then went, uh, uh, because Mr. Fanning wasn't reappointed by President Reagan, I was then uh, uh, assigned, our whole staff was assigned to Chairman, uh, NLRB Chairman Donald Dotson's staff. Now, for those of you who are historians of the National Labor Relations Act and the National Labor Relations Board, you will know that there are not two board members in the history of the board who were at further ends of the ideological spectrum than John Fanning and Donald Dotson. And my standard line on this subject is I'm very proud that I got the same annual evaluation from both Mr. Fanning and Chairman Dotson. Uh, and in fact, Chairman Dotson recommended me for what in the federal government at the time was known as a quality within grade, which was a slight increase in salary. Uh, but I left before I could get that. So when I came back to the board as a constitutionally challenged board member, I was looking for my money. Um, the, uh, I left in 1983 uh, to go to work for the Operating Engineers Union, uh, which is a medium-sized union with about 400,000 members, and it's a very decentralized organization, and so the in-house legal department at the International was small. I was the second lawyer. Uh, it ultimately expanded to three and then four lawyers, but it's never more than four lawyers. And uh, the operating engineers, for those of you who don't know, represent heavy equipment operators on construction sites primarily, and also uh, HVAC uh, building engineers who maintain boiler, boilers and things like that, HVAC engineers, things like that. So I did that for 28 uh, years, uh, the last 17 or 18 of which I was the general counsel of the union. 
And I generally say that the, those years, those 18 years as general counsel, I pretty much ceased practicing law, uh, which I think is generally true for general counsels. You end up sort of handling a lot of putting out fires and administrative matters and things like that. But I did keep my hand in uh, with respect to the National Labor Relations uh, Board and the National Labor Relations Act because uh, I participated regularly uh, in a number of groups that paid close attention to developments in board law. And for years, I wrote a chapter in a book that's called, used to be called the Building Trades Organizers Handbook and now is uh, called the Campaign Guide. Um, on National Labor Relations Board election procedures, specifically as they applied in the construction industry. So I sort of paid attention. But nonetheless, I was very, very surprised uh, to be nominated uh, by uh, President Obama uh, and very surprised to be recess appointed uh, by President Obama on January 4th of 2012, along with Sharon Block and Terry Flynn and the head of the uh, Consumer Finance Agency, Richard Cordry. But I did serve uh, for 20 months as a constitutionally challenged board member uh, and uh, enjoyed that time very much. But in order to work out the deal that uh, resulted in the five-member board getting confirmed uh, in August of, uh, I guess, yeah, August of last year, uh, it was necessary to remove, uh, withdraw the nominations of Sharon Block and myself. So there's a teeter-totter or a seesaw in Washington, and on one side there's me and Sharon Block. And on the other side, there's five members of the NLRB. There's Richard Cordry, the head of the Consumer Finance Agency. There's Tom Perez, the Secretary of Labor. There's Lisa, whose last name I forget, who runs the EPA. There is the head of the Alcohol and Tobacco and Firearms Agency, and there's a guy who's a bank board guy. And those are the people who got confirmed as a result of the deal uh, that uh, came about when uh, Sharon and I were withdrawn. And apparently the Senate seemed to think that while I was inappropriate for confirmation as a board member, I was perfectly fine to be confirmed as the general counsel. Uh, a, a position which, frankly, is a much more responsible position. Uh, so anyway, I was confirmed uh, under the old rules uh, when cloture still required 60 votes. Uh, uh, I got 62 votes uh, to stop the filibuster, uh, thereby earning the nickname of landslide. Uh, and I got 55 votes for confirmation for the board, uh, 50, it was bipartisan support, 54 Democrats and Lisa Murkowski from the great state of Alaska. Um, so I took office November 4th. It's been almost exactly a year that I have been the general counsel. Uh, in that time, a lot of things have happened, many of which I'm not going to talk about. I have a full report of that year, which I can give, but it takes three hours and your eyes will glaze over very quickly. Um, so I'm not going to talk about Walmart. Uh, I'm not going to talk about some other big cases. I'm going to talk about uh, four sort of what I would characterize as law reform efforts that are going on at the board right now. I'm going to talk about the joint employer issue. Uh, I'm not going to talk too much about McDonald's, but McDonald's is part of that. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, the issue of use of email uh, to communicate in uh, among employees, uh, the register guard issue, which is before the board in the case of Purple Communications. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, an area of the law that uh, the board has indicated it wants to change, or at least that it's open to hearing about change, and the courts of appeals have been very critical of the current board doctrine, and that's in the inability to pay area. And the fourth area I'm going to talk about is successorship where um, we have a couple of initiatives underway, one in the 10J area uh, and one uh, in the area of changing the law with respect to successors that are designated as perfectly clear successors. And I'm going to try and do that with leave enough time for questions. So first, joint employer. Uh, the board, in a case called Browning-Ferris, uh, earlier this year asked for briefing 
on whether or not its current standard, which it characterized as described in two cases from 1984, TLI and Laerco, whether that current standard should be changed, and if so, uh, what the new standard should be. And so the uh, Office of the General Counsel filed a brief in that uh, case uh, arguing for a change in the standard. And here I want to stop because the principal author of that brief is a graduate of West Virginia Law School, and I want to pay her special uh, note, uh, Megan Phillips, who is a lawyer in the Office of Advice and who is uh, a huge fan of the host of this conference, uh, is the principal author of the joint employer brief for the uh, Office of the General Counsel in Browning Ferris, and she did tremendous work. She does tremendous work all the time, uh, and she's a good example of the quality of the lawyers that I'm lucky enough to work with in the general counsel's office, both in, in headquarters in the field, because one of the interesting things about the job that somehow escaped my notice until I was in it is that the, the general counsel is the chief administrative officer of the agency. So there are approximately 1,610 people who work for the National Labor Relations Board, and 1,540 of them report directly to me, or through a chain up to me. So a lot of my work is really administrative, uh, not so much substantive law, but we're going to focus today on the substantive law area. So anyway, uh, the brief that Megan wrote, uh, we essentially argued a couple of things. First, we tried to lay out the, board, the history of the joint employer doctrine throughout the course of the, uh, the since 1935 when the act was passed. And, and our first point was that until 1984, from 1935 until 1984, the board applied essentially the same standard. And this standard, and, and we cite a lot of cases, and it was always a fact determinative uh, thing. A lot of facts were weighed. But essentially, the board looked at whether the putative joint employer had a direct or indirect effect on terms and conditions of employment. And the direct or indirect effect didn't have to be actual. It could be potential. In other words, there could be a contractual relationship between two entities that gave one of them authority to do something. And there wasn't, it wasn't necessary in, under the board's prior law that the, the entity that had the authority to do something actually do it, just that it had the potential authority to do it. So that was the original test, and it was a relatively what we, we characterized that as the traditional test. If you had the direct or indirect uh, actual or potential involvement in the determination of terms and conditions of employment. Uh, then in 1984, in two cases, TLI and Laerco, without announcing that it was changing the standard, without overruling any prior cases, without asking for briefing on the joint employer issue, the board essentially changed the standard. And what they did was they took certain direct and immediate impacts on terms and conditions of employment that had been looked at in prior cases as one of a number of factors that would result in a joint employer finding. And they ratcheted up the standard and said those had to be present in order for the entity, those things had to be done by the, the entity in order to, for it to be a joint employer. And so the test became over time uh, a test that has been characterized as in order to be considered a joint employer, the entity has to have a direct and immediate impact on substantial terms and conditions of employment and it has to be actual, it can't be potential. So that's, we trace the history, we talk about how the, the, the law changed, and then we say, essentially, that the board should return to its traditional view of joint employer, and the reason we say that is not just because we think it's right and the, the, the board in 84 and since has been wrong, but because the changing nature of employment over the interim period means that in order to have effective collective bargaining, you need entities that meet the traditional standard involved in the collective bargaining process. And so 
we use essentially two examples of that. The first is the contingent workforce example. And there were a number of very good amicus briefs filed uh, at, at, in Browning Ferris. But if you are at all interested in contingent, excuse me, contingent workforce issues, I suggest you take a look at an amicus brief that was filed on behalf of the University of Massachusetts at Amherst, uh, a law professor from Western New England and a professor from SUNY Potsdam filed the brief. And it is chock full of information from studies they've been doing at UMass Amherst on the contingent workforce. But in any event, one of the entities, one of the types of situations we say calls out for the, the use of the uh, more traditional joint employer standard is the current contingent workforce situation with temp agencies that provide people not for a day, not for two days, but frequently for three or four years. And what uh, the current administrator of Wage and Hour had when he was an academic, Dr. Weil, talked about the fissuring of the workplace. Uh, the second, and this is the one where a lot of noise was subsequently created, is in the area of franchisor-franchisee relationships. Now, in that area, we have a problem legally for our theory. And that is, in the, under the traditional theory, prior general counsels had authorized complaints against franchisors. Um, John Irving in the 70s authorized complaints. Arnold Ordman in the late 60s authorized complaints arguing that franchisors were joint employers with their franchisees. And the board said no, even under the old test. And they established essentially this, this, this principle that if the franchisor's involvement, indirect involvement in determining terms and conditions of employment, comes about as a result of the franchisor trying to protect the uniformity and quality of their brand, that's insufficient involvement to get them as joint employers. So here we are arguing for a return to the traditional standard, and here are these cases that under the traditional standard find no joint employer in the franchisor-franchisee relationship. And we say, don't overrule those cases. Those cases should remain good law. But one thing that had come to our attention in the course of a bunch of cases, including the McDonald's cases, is there is now a lot more involvement in certain contexts of franchisors with the day-to-day -day operations of their franchisees. And the reason for that is because of the enormous software capability that is now present. The technological capability, and this is true for everybody, I mean, we at the board uh, now have electronic case files. So the official case file is an electronic file. It's in a system called NextGen. Anybody who works at the agency on the GC side, if they want to see anything in the case file from any computer, they can do it. Um, that was not a capability that was present at the board even five or six years ago. Similarly, there are now all kinds of uh, ways that franchisors in real time can keep track of everything happening at the franchisee level. So for example, there are programs where, uh, where, uh, where a franchisor, national franchisor that might have thousands of franchisees has on its mainframe computer real time information about every franchisee's gross sales. And at the same time, they have real-time information about the minute-by-minute -minute labor costs going on in that particular franchisee. And they have programs that run an algorithm that say, once these costs get to a certain percentage of these costs, you got to start sending people home. Now, that type of involvement in the hours and uh, terms and conditions of employment of employees by the franchisor, we argue, goes beyond protecting the brand. And in those instances where those things are present, we think the franchisor ought to be named and held responsible as a joint employer. So that is the Browning-Ferris brief, essentially, uh, urging the board to return to the traditional standard using those two things. Megan did great work, as did the other people in advice. Subsequent to that uh, came, uh, uh, there had been a number of McDonald's cases that were pending uh, for a long time because of the fast food workers campaign around the country to raise wages uh, to $15 an hour and a number of other things. And individual franchisees of different uh, companies had retaliated against people. 
and there were pending charges. There were quite a few pending charges against McDonald's franchisees, and those charging parties in some instances had named McDonald's corporate as a joint employer. And so uh, subsequently in July, uh, after a lot of back and forth and meeting with the parties and having agendas, uh, there was a determination made to, uh, that there were merit to a number of these underlying unfair labor practice charges and that, excuse me, McDonald's should be named as a joint employer. And because once the parties were told this became a public thing because people started talking to the press, we issued a fairly plain vanilla uh, press release describing the fact that in some instances there were merit found, in some instances there weren't, and in those instances where merit was found and McDonald's was alleged as a joint employer, uh, in the charge we were um, authorizing proceeding against them as a joint employer. Now, the status of those cases right now is no complaints have actually issued. There are ongoing discussions with the parties about whether to resolve the cases, about if they're not resolved, how to try them, and those, th those discussions are not at a conclusive point. So no complaints have issued, um, and McDonald's is kind of an ongoing thing. And because there's a lot of potential litigation issues there, I'm not really going to in most instances, you'll find me perfectly willing and happy and able to be candid and talk on any topic. I'm not going to talk about McDonald's litigation strategy. Um, so that's joint employer. The second thing uh, that uh, is really was an initiative of Leif Solomons. Uh, he had issued a number of complaints seeking to overturn the board's register guard uh, decision, which said that employees didn't have a Section 7 right to use an employer's a computer system to engage in protected concerted communications. Um, and he had tried that, Leif had tried that in a number of cases, um, and the board had not taken him up on the offer. Um, and then uh, in a case called Purple Communications, uh, the board issued a notice uh, uh, of briefing and asked people to brief the issue of whether or not register guards should be overturned, and if so, what theory should be used. So. Uh, we are arguing in that case for register guard to be overturned, and the analysis that we suggest that the board use is the Republic Aviation analysis, where the employee's rights to engage in Section 7 activity are balanced against the employer's property rights, doing as little damage to either as is possible. And we suggest that under that scheme, uh, what the appropriate uh, uh, way to look at these things ought to be is that employees have a Section 7 protected right to engage in uh, these type of communications while not uh, uh, working, uh, while at work, but when they're not working, uh, subject to the employer making a substantial business uh, demonstration of that conduct impeding productivity or impeding other some other significant business interest of the employers. Um, our position, incidentally, is not the same, and there's little nuances here, it's not the same as the position of a number of the other uh, uh, amicus uh, who are seeking register guard to be overturned. There are some people who are sort of arguing what could be characterized as kind of a discrimination argument that essentially says that if an employer allows personal use of the computer, that it's essentially impossible to distinguish between personal use and, uh, and uh, union use or protected concerted activity use. And therefore, the employer could prohibit it completely, but if they allow any personal use, they have to allow the use for, for uh, Section 7 activity. And that's a little bit different than our argument. Um, but we think, uh, after talking to the other parties, we think it's a good idea for the board to have a diverse set of theories in front of it so that it can pick and choose and make its own mind up and have as well argued um, uh, each of those theories as possible. So that's the second uh, thing we're seeking to overturn Register Guard that's pending before the board. The third thing uh, is in the area of uh, inability to pay. Uh, there is a doctrine that has been around for a while that if a union makes a financial demand on the employer and the employer says, we are unable to pay that, and then the union seeks information of books and records and financial things like that the employer has an obligation 
uh, enforceable through Section 8A5 to produce, the, open the books, produce the financial information. But if what the employer says, as opposed to we're unable to pay, is that we don't want to pay or we think it would make us uncompetitive or some semantic variation on the theme, uh, then their obligation may be, well be very different. And they may not have an obligation to open the books. And this kind of semantic distinction has been criticized uh, most recently by uh, Judge Cabranes of the Second Circuit in a case called Stella de Oro Bakery that was decided a while ago. And in a case, uh, the board coupled products back a little while ago. The board indicated in a footnote that cited Judge Cabranes' uh, concurring opinion that uh, it was open to looking at this area of the law because the board said they want the duty to provide information to uh, be helpful to good faith collective bargaining, and it didn't seem like making these kind of semantic distinctions is helpful to good faith collective bargaining uh, because it shouldn't really turn on what you say at the bargaining table. It should turn more on the underlying nature of your claim. So we had a big inability to pay case uh, uh, coming out of the Cleveland region called Rotec that involved a big strike uh, where uh, the issue was whether or not the employer had sufficiently backed up its, its, uh, its concessionary demands and it had not provided information. And uh, in that instance, uh, we were arguing that in fact the employer really had claimed inability to pay, but in the alternative, if the judge had found that, that they hadn't made that claim, the, the law ought to be changed in this area to make it more rational and to promote good faith collective bargaining. Um, for the good of everyone involved in the case and um, to the detriment of our changing the law, they got a very good settlement, a strike settlement. Uh, they got a contract, 100% uh, back pay, a whole bunch of other things. And we approved a, a non-board settlement uh, in that case probably two weeks ago. So uh, there are a number of other complaints that have issued on this theory. Uh, but none of them have sort of reached fruition. They're not currently, I think at most, they're currently pending before administrative law judges. Final point, successorship. Um, I am a big believer in 10J as one of the effective remedies under the National Labor Relations Act. Interim injunctive relief uh, has proven to be extraordinarily effective in the 10L context where it is mandatory. Uh, if you look at the board's annual reports for the last 10 years, you will see that the number of times the board has to file a 10L petition seeking to enjoin union secondary activity is between two and four a year. Uh, this conduct has been essentially completely wiped out because of the effectiveness of 10L and the additional effectiveness of the 303 uh, cause of action for damages by any for anyone who's uh, adversely harmed by uh, union unlawful secondary activity. Uh, so, uh, based on that experience, as a, as a construction industry lawyer, I had more than my fair share of experiences with uh, 10L and 303. Uh, I think that it's important to have effective injunctive relief. I understand that 10J is different. It's not mandatory. It's discretionary. I understand that it requires a merit determination. Uh, whereas uh, the standard is lower with 10L. But nonetheless, I think uh, 10J is very important to make sure in those instances where there's potential remedial failure because of the length of the board's administrative processes that we get in and restore the status quo. Uh, so I put out a memo earlier in the year that said, A, I endorsed the prior uh, Ron Meisberg when he was the general counsel started an initiative for uh, first contract bad faith bargaining. I endor endorsed that, and we are still chasing those cases hard in the 10J area. Leif, had a, Leif Solomon, who was the next general counsel, my immediate predecessor, had an initiative on 10J relief for what he called nip in the bud organizing cases, where an organizing campaign at a nascent phase uh, was cut off because the employer disciplined or discharged the lead organizer or somebody active in the campaign. And I endorse that as well. But I have added a third category of cases. And those are successorship refusal to hire cases. These are situations where you have a predecessor employer with a collective bargaining agreement. A successor employer comes in. And in order to avoid this, the obligation to bargain, uh, has a scheme not to hire an, a sufficient number of people that 
the obligation transfers. Um, and these cases are very hard. Uh, they tend to go on a long time because what happens is the successor employer starts acting like they're entitled to set terms and conditions of employment, to act unilaterally. So they start changing things all, and they're very difficult to get those back. The people who are not hired discriminatorily, those people have to work someplace, so they scatter to the winds. And getting them back to work is very difficult. And putting the union back in the place, it would be power-wise if they had been recognized and bargained with immediately upon this, the successor uh, taking over is almost impossible to do. So I like to, it's hard to put Humpty Dumpty back together again. So, so uh, and the, the classic example of this is a case that, uh, that uh, happened in this state, the Massey uh, case, where you had an, an unbelievable uh, uh, scheme to uh, avoid successor obligation. And one of the things I was very happy about was being in the majority on that case. And even though, uh, pursuant to no canning, there's no precedential value uh, to our decisions, uh, that case settled when it was in the D.C. Circuit. And uh, uh, it was a, a joint settlement between a new company that bought uh, that facility and the mine workers. And that was actually, it wasn't a good result because it took way too long and too many people were harmed. But ultimately, uh, the decision uh, the, the matter was resolved successfully. Uh, but anyway, successorship refusal to hire is now a 10-J priority. Uh, and we will be chasing those cases the same way we are uh, chasing uh, or going after uh, first contract bad faith bargaining and uh, nip in the bud organizing. The other, and I'll end on this note, uh, the other successor issue uh, has to do with perfectly clear successors um, after Burns was decided by the Supreme Court, there was a decision in a case called Spruce Up, where the board, and it's, if you ever want to read a very interesting, and I'm using that term advisedly, board decision, you should read Spruce Up. Spruce Up involves barber shops on a military base. And there were a bunch of them on this big military base. And a guy who had been a barber uh, took over the contracts of some of them, not all of them. And the issue was whether uh, he could, he, and he kept all the same barbers, or almost all the same barbers, uh, and the question was whether he could set uh, initial terms and conditions of employment as a perfectly clear successor, or whether he had to bargain over initial terms and conditions of employment. And uh, the board, in a very long decision that has a three-person majority and has two separate dissents, one by John Fanning and one by Doc Pinello, um, determined that if the, the doctrine ultimately came to stand for, if the, the perfectly clear successor announces clearly to the employees new terms and conditions of employment, then it, that entity can set those. But if they do something less than perfectly clearly announce things and let people know what the new terms and conditions are, then it's a violation of the law to unilaterally act. Now, this, this doctrine has been around for a long time, but when Fred Feinstein was the general counsel back in the 90s, uh, he didn't think this made a lot of sense, and he I uh, had a couple of cases where he sought to overturn this doctrine and move to a rule that would require the perfectly clear successor to bargain over initial terms and conditions of employment, not set them unilaterally. And he got as far as getting a concurring opinion in a case from Chairman Gould saying, yeah, the general counsel's right, that's what the law should be. But it never became the majority position of the board. The people in advice have been chomping at the bit to get back at this for a long time. And, uh, and lo and behold, in a case called Nexio Solutions, which has been pending before the board for a while, the charging party, SEIU, and the AFL-CIO are arguing the same thing, that we should, as I say, spruce up, spruce up, which, and uh, change the law with respect to perfectly clear successors. And so um, after discussing it with advice, uh, we are uh, proceeding on theories in a number of cases where we have perfectly clear successors, where we think that they don't meet the spruce up test because they haven't announced clearly, 
But in addition, we're arguing that uh, spruce up should be modified and changed along the lines as advocated by the parties in Nexio Solutions and along the lines that uh, General Counsel Feinstein had previously argued. So quite a few other issues before the board. I'm happy to discuss any of them. Um, but rather than me go on further, uh, I thought I'd stop now and ask for questions. About anything I talked about or anything else? Yes. Yes. Well, the political retaliation I would expect for 10J is the least of my worries in terms of political retaliation if the, uh, if the Senate changes in November. Um, I think what's likely to happen and what did happen uh, when Fred ramped up the 10J program was there were riders placed or there were riders attempted to be placed on the board's appropriations. And that is a classic way that um, Congress attempts to affect the type of work that the board does without amending the statute. Because if they try and amend the statute and they're successful, which they haven't been, but assume for purposes of discussion they, they amended it adversely, I think the president would likely be to, would likely veto such uh, an amendment. But if you've got a big budget package and all there is is a rider on the board's budget, and remember the board's budget is $265 million. That is less than a drop in the ocean of the federal budget. Um, the president is not going to veto a budget bill over one rider on the board's budget. So right now we have a, a rider that's been on there for quite some time, which is um, a, a couple years ago the board had the temerity to put out a notice asking for input about whether electronic voting was a possibility. It wasn't a rule, it was, it was just a request for information. But there has been for several years a rider on the board's budget prohibiting the board from exploring in any way, shape, or form uh, electronic voting. Uh, so my guess would be, uh, and I think this, that if people were unhappy about the way the 10J program was going, that they would, um, they would try and put a rider on the budget that would somehow affect the way 10J was done. Um, the thing to remember, and I hate to say this because it's, admitted, it's an admission against interest, is we get about 22,000 charges a year. 70% of those, there's no merit found. So 70% right away are gone. 30% where there's a, merit, there's a merit determination, of that 30%, 90% of those cases are settled pre-complaint. So the number of complaints that are actually issued is, is of the number of total charges filed is relatively small. Of the num it's in the 1,500, 1,600 a year range. The number of cases that were submitted for 10J consideration last year to the general counsel's office from the regions were about 160. Um, many of those were submitted with no-go recommendations not to proceed on 10J, but they were submitted because of the, the initiatives that my predecessors started require that if you have a nip in the bud case or if you have an, uh, an initial bad faith bargaining case, you have to submit it with a recommendation to Washington. Um, many of those, there's recommendations for not to proceed with 10J. And the reason has nothing to do with the underlying merits of the unfair labor practice. The reason is that there is another component of obtaining injunctive relief. And that is, in, in some circuits, it's characterized as just and proper, that the, that the, that the uh, entrance of the, or the putting uh, the, the courts granting the injunctive relief is just and proper, and there's separate evidence that you have to produce of irreparable harm. It's separate from the, from the uh, evidence with respect to the merits of the unfair labor practice. And so you can have an egregious unfair labor practice, but if you can't demonstrate that it's slowing down the union campaign, um, you can't get it, or well, you have trouble meeting that aspect of the test. So last year, I think we only saw it, I mean, we went to the board for authorization in 
you know, probably around 40 cases or a little over 40 cases. So we're talking about the tip of the tip of the tip of the iceberg here in terms of the cases that come to the board. I think they're important because I think in big cases like the Kellogg's lockout case in Memphis, for example, it was absolutely crucial to get the injunctive relief. Um, but, uh, and, and there, I could cite a couple other examples. And it, they're very important to send a message. And most of the cases that we get authorized, we don't have to file because the other party settles immediately in the face of the respondent settles immediately, which might argue for authorizing more of them. Um, but we have a pretty rigorous standard before we go. And what happens is it comes into Washington to the injunction litigation branch, then we send a memo to, uh, to the board seeking authorization, and the board uh, authorizes it. Um, and I think my record so far, and I only say this not because I'm bragging, but because this is a point that Harry Johnson always makes as a board member because he wants to scare the management bar, is that I have a perfect record in getting authorizations from the board where I've sought 10-J authorization. So he says, if the region tells you that the general counsel is seeking injunctive relief, he's going to get it. So you better act accordingly. Um. So one of the cases that's come up in the House this morning, the number of times, is um, how the National Labor Relations Act also reaches, uh, it's not just about workers reporting unions. Yes. It's about workers engaged in collective activity to try to improve their conditions. And um, the board has in recent years tried to make more of that and use it more out We have a lot of PC, what we call PCA cases. Um, we have a ton of those cases. Um, and I'll give you one right now, which is fascinating. Um, the, which just yesterday we authorized complaint on. CTAC, uh, they passed an ordinance raising uh, the wage for people who work out there to $15 an hour. And in order to be an entity covered by that, you have to have 25 or more employers, employees. And this company, which parks cars at remote lots, had, um, had more than 25 employees, but on a full-time equivalent basis, they decided that they had fewer than 25 employees. They said, well, we have some we have a couple of So if you look at it from a standpoint, you actually are not covered by the statute. So they took the position they weren't covered by the statute. And a couple of people who worked for them, who wanted $15 an hour, went to them and said, are you guys going to pay? And they said, no. So they wrote letters. They got together, and they each wrote individual letters, but they did it as a joint effort to the city of Seattle, saying these guys aren't paying. And the city of Seattle, in what I think was not the most effective way of going about trying to enforce the statute, mailed the letters to the employer with a cover letter with, with, with a cover letter saying, you should check and see whether or not you're compliant. So, guess what happened to those of the 11? They fired 11 people. Nine of them were letter signers. But they say the reason that they fired the people was they reorganized so as to get themselves under the 25 so that they wouldn't be subject to the statute. So we're saying, A, it's retaliation for the people's protected concerted activity kind of thing. But we're also saying the reorganization was retaliatory. Now, for those of you who are following the ins and outs of Obamacare, you may know that there is a lot of work going on to get people under the number of hours such that they're entitled to coverage. Be interesting to see if a similar thing came up in that context. That'd make the McDonald's noise. <laughs> anyway, uh, but to answer your question, we are we are um, we are seeing a lot of PCA cases. Um, we are trying, you know, we are restricted in our outreach in a number of ways. We have no line item in our budget for outreach. Uh, the EEOC, for example, they have a line item. They have in every regional office an outreach coordinator. 
Um, we don't have any of that in the board, uh, partly because the board is essentially a re has historically been essentially a reactive agency. We wait till somebody files a charge and then we pursue it. We don't have any independent investigative authority. It's a very interesting compare. If you look at the EOC or Wage and Hour or other entities that are charged with enforcing labor laws, we have a kind of unique combination in that we, there is no private right of action under our statute. So we have the exclusive authority to proceed, but we don't have any independent investigative authority. So we are totally reliant on people coming to us with charges. And there is a broad lack of uh, understanding uh, of rights under the National Labor Relations Act, both in the employee community and in the employer community. Um, with respect to the latter, I would cite the fact that there have been recent studies that say that there are 60% of employee handbooks that have rules in them that restrict employees' ability to discuss wages and compensation, which has been black letter law unlawful for a lot of years. Um, I think it's largely because of ignorance. People don't know that's a violation of the law. Um, in any event, uh, there was an attempt, as you all know, to change that by promulgating notices that would be posted. There was a rulemaking to have people post notices of rights, and that was uh, struck down by the courts. And so we're limited uh, with respect to that. We are trying to develop outreach programs, and particularly to underserved communities. We tend to do very well in terms of speaking engagements and relationships with the organized bar and with you know labor and management groups and things like that. We don't do very well with respect to uh, immigrant communities, uh, faith communities, and other groups where uh, it's likely that people who need to know about their rights under the National Labor Relations Act uh, you know, have points of contact. So we have a very broad outreach committee that's been put together. We have some incredible regional outreach work. The region in Chicago is doing unbelievable outreach work. Um, and they have a train trainer program where they bring in people from faith-based organizations. They do a session training those people on rights under the National Labor Relations Act. They turn around and do uh, training sessions for their, uh, their uh, church members. And that has proven very successful, and we're trying to use that as a model, along with some others. We have a group. It turns out that, and, and this should be no surprise to those of you who are law students, uh, it turns out that the young lawyers at the agency are passionate about outreach. So we have um, so a bunch of working groups that are put together, and there's one that I just was advised of. The lawyers in, in uh, Region 2 in Manhattan and Brooklyn and in Newark have a joint regional uh, thing that they're just doing their own thing, doing outreach. Um, and I'm trying to direct people to them uh, uh, because they have their, there's a lot of energy in that group. There's a lot of energy in the, the people who work at the board um, uh, that we need to take best advantage of, particularly the young lawyers. Um, so I, that wasn't exactly an answer to the question. But, um, anybody else? Please, come on. I feel one of the things about being not a board member where I couldn't talk about anything, uh, and now I am the general counsel, and I feel very free to talk about almost anything. So I'm happy to, yes? Our budget constrains everything we do in, in ways that um, I could spend a week telling you. Um, one thing is we haven't had trial training in about five years, which means we, ha we have people out there who are trying cases, new attorneys who haven't received any trial training. There is a piece of the trial training that involves 10J. 10J is very different because you're going into federal court in an, in, on a motion as opposed to trying something in front of an ALJ. It's a, it's a different process. It's a different set of circumstances. And um, it requires some different training. We are very lucky in that the people in the injunction litigation branch that's part of advice are very experienced people. They have very good re relationships with the regional people. 
they do a really good job of mooting people beforehand, uh, et cetera. But still, um, if we had more reason, one of the first things that when we had the sequester, and this was sort of at the, you know, I, it was, I saw the, the planning leading up to it as a board member, and then I was unemployed for a couple months, and I was actually unemployed while it happened, and then I got confirmed later, and I saw the consequences of it. But the, the sequence of that, in order to avoid furloughs, was, among other things, to cancel all training. Um, because about 90% of the board's budget is salaries and benefits. The whole rest of the operation is 10%. And not to tell you, not to dwell too much on my current biggest problem, but we are in the middle of moving the agency headquarters from 14th Street to Half Street, which is over by the baseball stadium, if you know Washington at all. Um, we are doing this pursuant to a mandate from GSA. This is not something we sort of thought up, oh, this is a good idea. Um, and and, uh, and the part of the mandate is that we move into 70% of the space that we currently occupy. Um, and so, because we want to have a smaller footprint, and these are all good reasons. They're, I'm not criticizing it; just it's a problem to do. Um, but that involves build out for the new space. That involves a whole bunch of other stuff. There is no separate appropriation in our budget for the costs of the move. Now, what the thinking is is we're going to get lower rent at the new place, and so we'll achieve a savings. But we're not achieving a savings this fiscal year when we got to move over there, when we got to pay for the build out, when we got to do all this other stuff. So the only way we can do that is get rid of other stuff that we don't have enough money to pay for in the first place. Um, so that is what we're in the process of trying to do. In addition, there are several inequities in the structure of the way people are compensated that we're trying to do something about. My budget priority in the last fiscal year, which, anyway, supervisors in the field who supervised 10, 15, 20 people for 15, 20 years were GS-14s. In headquarters, all supervisors were 50, and there were independent 15s who didn't supervise anybody. This has been going on for 30 years. This was a gnawing problem. It went, you know, people were pissed off about it in the field, and I made it my budget priority. I'm making sure that the supervisor in the field are 15s. So we did that last April. But guess what? There's a cost to that. And what happens then is their grade compression. So now everybody over 15 is saying, what are you going to do for me? Uh, and you know, they have legitimate interests. Um, so. It's a, it's a challenge administratively. But to your point of 10J, to do training, to have more people who would be ready to do the cases would be a cost. We have the capability internally to do the training. We have the knowledge to convey. It's just the cost of assembling people, et cetera. So we're trying to do it through the website. We're trying to do it through you know, uh, online stuff, but it's not the same as bring people in and actually doing it with them. Um, but it would be a cost. Nobody else? No. Please. Okay. Thank you.